Hello, my name is John Agnes, and welcome to my talk, Tracking Down What Happened, a Comparison of Tracing Solutions, where I'll be comparing four different tracing solutions available on Linux. Now, when I first got started with this talk, thinking about how to do it, I wasn't really sure how to present it in a way without being biased. I myself do a lot of tracing, and uh, there are certain ones, obviously, that I prefer, but I really wanted to... so have an unbiased approach to which tracing solution and also I didn't want to choose a problem where I knew for example that certain tracing solutions are better than others for this particular problem. So for this uh, reason I s attacked it from another direction and I decided first I will uh, define an, ob an objective, a set of objectives that I want to get out of this talk uh, and I went through it like this. So the first thing I did was I defined a scenario and problem that I would like to investigate for tracing. Right, so without thinking about any tracers or any particular application, just define uh, a problem that I would like to investigate. And once I define the problem, then I will go and choose an application uh, that where I can uh, investigate this particular problem. And then I will use the four different uh, tracing solutions, the main ones available for Linux, so ftrace, ebpf, system tap, and l. TTNG uh, to perform the tracing that I want uh, to get done for this particular uh, problem and scenario. Now at the end I will rank these based on usability, their ability to present to present their results, uh, how much they affected the runtime of the application while they were tracing, how available they are on uh, particular distributions. Uh, I chose uh, four the four main base distributions, so Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, uh, and Arch are the ones I chose. Uh, so how available and how well did they work on these different distributions? And then of course an overall summary. Just a quick uh, disclaimer, uh, be aware that all of this ranking at the end, I know the ranking is what a lot of people really like to see. It's really based on this particular problem that I choose and, and the scenario. So for a different problem, a different scenario, the ranking actually may be different, but hopefully uh, this will be realistic enough that uh, this ranking is applies to many situations, hopefully. So... The first thing I did was decide what problem do I want to investigate. And usually uh, complex problems, for example, with inter-process communication, uh, this is something that often uh, when we're writing applications or embed applications, we really need to focus what is the problem there. If we feel like our communication is, the inter-process communication is, is not efficient or is uh, we're not meeting certain deadlines or there's certain latencies and we need to know where is this coming from, uh, obviously there's lots of great profiling tools out there, but the problem with profiling tools is it's really hard to really understand what's happening during the inter process communication. Yeah? Like, for example, if I want to know what was my maximum latency, or uh, is this maximum latency normal, or is it happen all the time? Is this just a, a normal in a, in a great one? If I were to create a histogram of latencies, is this uh, a huge outlier, or does it fall within uh, these norms? Uh, and for example, and of course, the most important thing is is what happens when we hit this maximum latency. Why did this latency occur? And if we're using profiles, uh, profiling tools, uh, usually you can get some information. Okay, we know there was a lot of page faults there, or we know that there was you know a lot of uh, CPU cycles. The CPU was busy, but really, what you want to do is you want to know a, qu a sequence of events. What actually happened during this maximum latency uh, situation? I want to know who was on the CPU, who got scheduled scheduled, who was supposed to wake up, and for these kind of things, really, you need tracing, right? So tracing is an optimal uh, so method and, and solution for the inter-process communication scenario, and that's why I chose inter-process communication for the problem I want to investigate. Now, I also needed to set up some conditions for these tests. So what kinds of things did I want to do and then decide that I could have sort of a basis for even deciding if these tools were good enough for me. So obviously, I need to first choose an application that uses inter-process communication, right? So I need to pick an application that's out there that's using that. And what I decided is I want to measure every single inter-process communication that this application uh, 
performs, right? So if it sends thousands of, event, of, of intercommunication data back and forth, I want to really have the latency of every single one of these, the time from send to receive on every single one of these measured. I don't want it's not to be sampled or things like this. I really wanted to measure them all. That was important for me. For the one that was the longest, the one that had the greatest latency, I want to be able to uh, see the scheduling uh, activity that took place during that. Okay, so you were do, we're running the application, it's doing enterprise communication, and one of these is the longest of, of them all, and I want to know everything that was uh, being uh, being scheduled during that time. And then the last criterion is that I didn't want to have to modify the application. Yeah, so I, I'm going to choose an application that already exists, and I want to just use that application. I don't want to have to like write code or things like this. I just want to uh, to use this application as it is. Right. So these were the conditions that I set up uh, for the, you know, when I do these tracing tests. Now the application I chose, uh, I had never done this before. Uh, I'm a real-time developer, and there's a tool called Hackbench that we use to uh, generate a lot of scheduling loads on the CPU. And so Hackbench is a is a great tool just to uh, you know blast the scheduler and just uh, make sure that, that everything's being scheduled correctly. Now the way that Hackbench works is it uses a lot of interprocess communication. And so I thought, well actually this would be a nice application for my tracing tests if I use the interprocess communication that's happening within Hackbench as the interprocess communication that I want to investigate. So the way that Hackbench works is basically you'll create n senders and n receivers and a, a a little piece of data is going to be sent through Unix local domain sockets. Each sender is going to send it to each receiver, right? So if I have 10 senders, 10 receivers, then there will be 10 each sending to 10. So there'll be 100 uh, interprocess communication events that, that, that take place there. Uh, so that's the way the hack pitch works, and that's how I'll be using it. Now, the test system that I chose to do all of these tests that we're going to be seeing the results for was a Fedora Linux uh, version 34, which is the current version to download. It was actually released last May. Uh, I'm not a really big Fedora user, actually, but the reason why I chose Fedora is it was the only distribution that supported all of the features in all of the tracing solutions that I uh, am, will be presenting. It was the only one that could do them all. So uh, that was the obvious choice for me for performing these tests. Now, when I'm running Hackbench, uh, I'm doing it with a real-time priority policy, uh, SCED FIFO, with a real-time priority of 70. That's just to make sure that the, any other noise on the system is not really affecting my test because I'm going to be doing timing tests, and I really want to do, uh, compare these timings. And just to try to be fair, uh, I, I used a real-time uh, priority there in policy. And the value for n, the number of senders and the number of receivers I chose was 20. So I have 20 senders, 20 receivers, which means there will be 400 interprocess communication uh, activities uh, during the test. Now, when you're talking about Unix local domain sockets, so we have one process that's sending through a Unix local domain socket to another process a bit of data. What actually happens there? What what is, when I'm tracing, what is interesting there? Now, when we talk about tracing, what you need to talk about are trace points. And these are points in code, either in user space code or in kernel code, that are interesting uh, when the CPU goes through. You want to uh, generate an event at this moment, or you want to do something at this moment at these different points in code that are interesting for the thing you know, that you are are investigating. Now, when we're talking about interprocess communication with Linux local domain sockets, there's actually these four points here that I identified as critical that's interesting for, for tracking that interprocess communication. So we have, for example, the sender. We start off in the sender in user space, and the sender is going to do a write on that Unix local domain file descriptor. Uh, it's going to do a write to send that data. And right before that write is called, that is the first point that's interesting. That's actually where I'm going to take a timestamp. That's actually where I'm going to start my clock. How long does this interprocess communication uh, require? Now, when the write system call is called and we go down into kernel code, uh, at some point the kernel is going to allocate a socket buffer for this Unix local domain socket's interprocess communication. Now, when that uh, socket buffer is allocated, we're still in the context of our sender, uh, but we're here we're allocating a unique buffer. Uh, this is the next point that's interesting because 
we're still the sender, but now we're in kernel space. So that's an, inter an interesting place to be. Now, when this buffer gets transmitted to the receiver, then the receiver in kernel space is the one that will obviously pull the data from the socket buffer, but then it will release that socket. It will actually free that socket buffer, right? So it's not going to be copied in the kernel. It's actually going to be handed over to the receiver, and the receiver is the one that actually will free that in user in, in sorry in kernel space. So that is the third event that's interesting because we're still dealing with the same buffer, but now we're in the context of the receiver, right? So we had the, the sender in the context of the current that moves down to the kernel. Now we're still in the kernel, but we're in the context of the receiver. And then of course the final event is is when we come back into user space as the receiver, uh, and the receiver will call is comes out of the read system call. And in the moment when it comes out of that system call, that's where we can take a timestamp and we can stop our clock, right? So we're basically we want to know from the time the write is about to be called to the time that we return from read, that is what we're going to call our IPC latency, how long it took to transfer the data from A to B. So these are the four events that are interesting for that. Now the scheduling activity, I also said for the longest latency, I want to know everything that's on the CPU or got scheduled during that time. There's two uh, events that I can use, one called sched wake up and sched switch. Uh, this is basically when uh, a task uh, gets set runnable, yeah, it should be put on the CPU, it gets woken up, so that's the sched wake up, and then when the task actually gets on the CPU is the sched switch. So these two events are actually quite interesting when you're looking at scheduling, just to see, okay, who was getting woken up and who actually made it to the CPU. Uh, these are the events that I'm going to be interested in interested in to just see who's on the CPU. Now keep in mind these events are interesting during that period of the greatest IPC latency, right? That's why I'm, I'm doing this for that. Now for the events 2, 3, 5, and 6, there's already uh, trace events in the kernel. Now the kernel already has these set up, so it's really easy to use these events. For event number 1 and 4, these are user space this is user space code, there is no existing event. So I actually will have to create events from user space. And there's a couple of mechanisms to do that. For example, there's something called user space probes, where I can dynamically just uh, choose points in the executable where these events will be uh, broadcast. Or there's something called uh, user space uh, statically defined uh, trace points where I can actually modify the code and, and actually add the trace points into Hackbench. Now, I already mentioned I don't want to modify code, so I'm only going to use USDT if I have to. We'll see if I have to or not. So now we have these for sh different points that we've defined. Yeah, we have the four points that are critical when we're tracing the interprocess communication. And then we have the, the various events uh, dealing with scheduling, just so we can see what's on the CPU during that uh, maximum IPC time. Now, the way I am able to coordinate this is because each event, each trace point, has certain information that is also made available. Uh, so there's certain attributes that are available. And for example, uh, at the user space uh, event, if I know the PID, then that's something uh, useful. Okay, now I know that this uh, this task is about to do the right. And for example, in the when the uh, buffer is being allocated in the kernel, there's a KMEM cache alloc node event. There I also obviously have the PID but I also get, for example, the pointer address for the buffer that was allocated. And with the free, I also have the PID and the the pointer uh, of the buffer I just am releasing. And obviously, when we get back in user space, I also have that PID. So using this information, I can now coordinate and create a flow from this one to four, yeah. So, for example, if I P, we see here in red, these two will be the same, right? So, if I'm at the second event, if I'm in this KMM cache alloc node event, I can see did I previously see this event, right? Because they, it's it's uh, synchronous uh, uh, in time, right? So, if I see that one, then I know, okay, this we are dealing with this scenario. Uh, just like when I get to the third uh, event, when I see that this pointer is the same pointer that this previous event had uh, stored, 
then I know, okay, we're dealing with this, right? So just there's always one piece, one attribute that matches with the previous piece so that I can kind of follow the data and move through there. And at the end, then I know, okay, this is the timestamp uh, and, and this is the PID of the sender and I know my PID and my current timestamp. I could put that all together and uh, have the latency trace there. Right? Scheduling is actually quite simple there because you need to associate, you have schedule wake-ups and schedule switches when I actually get on the CPU. Uh, how do I know which switch goes to which wake-up? That's, you can see there because uh, the wake-up is on a certain task, the, the certain PID, and with schedule switch, I see which one is now getting on there, right? So measuring the distance between these two is also the effective latency uh, between waking up a process and it being scheduled. Okay, so with this information now, this is everything that I need now to begin choosing tracing. So I haven't talked about any tracing methods yet, but now I have, uh, these are actual trace points uh, in, in the kernel that are available. Uh, I can create these user space and, and very, through U probes or through USDT, I can create these user space trace points. Uh, and then I can use these trace points with this exact information and now I can perform my tracing. So now it's just a question of which tracing tool should I use. So let's begin with ftrace. So ftrace is built into the kernel, right? So every Linux kernel had the ftrace uh, tracer inside of it. Uh, it supports all the kernel tracing events that are there. It has full support for the U probes. These are the dynamic uh, user space uh, tracing events demand that you can uh, uh, define. Uh, it's available through TraceFS, which is a uh, pseudo file system uh, similar to like PROC or SIS. Yeah. Uh, and basically you use ECHO or CAT to set data or to read current settings, right? So uh, through, hey, just with ECHO and CAT, you can basically do anything you need to do. Uh, now there's a little bit more high level tool called Trace Command uh, to do the ECHO and CATting for me. Uh, but uh, this, this is a convenience thing. Really all you need is the ECHO and the CAT. The ftrace uh, tracing solution is capable of processing uh, data in the kernel, right? So you can actually, this whole chain of how, you know, we, we saw that we have to look at the previous events to de so it decide does this event correspond to the previous net events, right? Because we're following, all this IPC happens at the same time, right? We need to be, to be able to follow these different IPC paths. Uh, and uh, ftrace is able to track all that in real time in the system. So really in, in live on the system, uh, there's something called sy sy synthetic events and histograms, and it can use those to actually track these different IPC methods. Uh, traces are also available for recording so that you can also do post-processing uh, as well afterwards. And there's a graphical tool called Kernel Shark uh, that allows you to view these uh, recorded uh, traces uh, graphically, which sometimes can be really helpful uh, if you have uh, some sort of complicated uh, contention system uh, uh, situation or something like this, right? So uh, that's also there, Kernel Shark. Here is a sample of the ftrace commands. Here you see I'm just doing everything with echo. There's no uh, fancy tool that I need and I'm just uh, in syskernel debug tracing. Uh, that's basically usually where tracefs is mounted. And uh, you could see here is uh, where I'm setting these up. Now I have here, these are comments. Uh, I don't, I'm not gonna go through this right now. We don't have enough time. Uh, but this is just kind of showing you how I'm setting up the various synthetic events so that I can track each of these uh, points in this flow, right? So initially I'm interested in the timestamps before write, and then I want to know the timestamp and the, the PID of the sender when we're, uh, when we are allocate, uh, allocating that buffer. When we're freeing the buffer, you know, this information just keeps being passed on to the next. Uh, and then finally at the end, I have the sender PID, the, the sender timestamp, uh, the receiver PID, and the receiver timestamp, right? So this is just collecting all that data through these four different steps uh, by creating several uh, synthetic events here. And then I can later take a look at the data that it collected. And here you're saying what that looks like, right? So after I've run Hackbench now, uh, then I just have to look at with here again, I'm just using cat. Uh, I can look at this uh, histogram file in the synthetic event IPC end, but that was my final synthetic event where everything is there. Uh, 
Uh, and here's basically what it looks like. It's automatically, not automatically, It's uh, I have it set to sort on these latencies, the diff from the send to the receive. Uh, so I can really easily see the different latencies that are available uh, or that were caused during this interprocess communication. We see that there was exactly 400 of them. So it's a running system and I start hack batch and then I have the 400 events at the end uh, sorted on latency. Uh, and from here, I can also see, for example, the largest latency, which was uh, 6 point, uh, so 6.2 uh, milliseconds, uh, was coming from uh, the process 100022 being sent to data to 9985. Yeah. Actually, we're saying 9985. Is it the top, the the, the four worst are off on 9985? Uh, this poor process got a lot of latency in in the uh, messages that were sent to it. Uh, now, from this information, I can go back and look at the trace and, for example, to grab the actual timestamps of the worst. So this is that worst case from 1022 to 9985 uh, are these timestamps. Uh, that's not automatically generated. It is possible to, with synthetic events to also create this, but uh, it, it's a very simple information that I just wanted to get at the end. So I just uh, manually parse this from uh, the trace information. Now, what sometimes what you like to see is a nice uh, histogram, and so with a little bit of Python code, there's not a lot here. <laughs> Python uh, is really easy for things like this. Uh, I could take uh, this uh, this data that we previously saw. This it is also a histogram, but it's just a you know it's more like it's more like a, a sorted hash table, uh, and I can actually turn that into something that is a really nice overview because we wanted to know is that an outlier right is this really an extreme situation or does it fit within the normal picture and we're seeing that this maximum case uh, sitting in this uh, in the six millisecond to six and a quarter millisecond bucket uh, we're seeing that's actually totally normal in the curve right this isn't some huge crazy outlier in the latency there right so we can see that really easily and then here, finally, is with the kernel shark uh, tool, we can take a look graphically at this, these traces uh, and see what it looks like. So this is the exact same. This is all done with one run with Hackbench. Uh, and again, these are the same. We can't really see on the slides there. Uh, everything's too small, but this is the, uh, the same PID. So here's the receiver PID. Uh, and it shows it graphically, so we can see every the CPUs are pretty loaded up the whole time with different. And if, uh, if I was actually in the tool, I could see that these are actually all ha different uh, Hackbench processes running. Uh, just for fun, I added some more tasks there because you can look at individual tasks. So this is, for example, uh, an RCU task, and we see s several K workers there. Uh, and these last two are the actual worst case uh, pair that's communicating, right? So here down here, this is actually the sending uh, process and here's the receiving process, right? So you can see that actually this whole time, uh, the, you know, the, the sender was done here, but during this whole time, the receiver uh, was not scheduled until the end. And this was, this is that latency, that maximum latency, right? And I can choose with, with Kernel Shark, I can choose any particular task get now to look at and to investigate why. Why did it not get scheduled uh, during all of this time? Well, we see there's lots of stuff on there, but, you know, how fair is that uh, that I have to wait behind all these other tasks, right? So these are things I can easily, uh, so investigate. So for the final results for F-Trace, um, the runtime increased 44% on Hackbench. Uh, now, this 44% is a, a real number, but obviously Hackbench runs does a lot really fast, so it's, it's, it's a small amount of time here. We're talking about six milliseconds, right? So uh, normally it was like four and a half milliseconds, and it increased to like six and a half milliseconds, right? So it's a very small window, uh, and there's doing a, it's just doing pure interprocess communication, right? So F trace is really the tracer is really doing a lot. Right, so if it was like a norm, so if it was an application where there was lots going on, and what I'm tracing is a small component of that, then you may not see this overhead. Nevertheless, uh, this no, this number is valid as a comparator number between the other trace methods I'm going to show, right? Because they're all using the same program, and they're all I'm, I'm comparing the runtime for this. Uh, how this four milli, four and a half milliseconds are, are changed from the different uh, tracers. So that's how it is a valid number for comparing between the two, but obviously it might be slowly inf inflated because I'm using an application that's only doing interprocess communication uh, and very heavily, right? So the runtime uh, for uh, F-Trace, the, this, these are num number increased 44%. Uh, 
positive thing has in-kernel processing, right? So at the end, I run hackbedge, and then I just cat this file, and boom, I can see automatically, so forth, uh, immediately what my worst uh, uh, latency was. I have the graphical viewing with kernel shark, which is very comfortable to really in details look at what's going on there. All I need really is echo and cat to actually do the tracing. So I can actually record the tracing and then take it offline and look at it offline later if I wanted. But I mean, there's not a lot you have to install in your machine. You need a kernel, right? And on all four of the base uh, distributions I tested, uh, ftrace was available, which you can expect because it's, it's a part of the kernel, right? Now, some of the, the downsides of ftrace is that you are going to most likely have to do some manual post-processing, right? So you'll have to do some, some grep and sed, maybe uh, awk work with the traces cell themselves, uh, or, you know, you're going to have to take, like, for example, the re results uh, from the synthetic event uh, hash table, and, and maybe you'll have to, you know, like what I did to, to get uh, the worst... Uh, the worst case timestamps, right? So there, there might be something, and usually when you're dealing with ftrace, there is some stuff you're gonna have to do there. So uh, when you're dealing with ftrace, it's pretty rare that you can just say, hey, I only need kernel shark and I can do everything. You probably are gonna have to do some things uh, just to look at the traces manually and get some information. Uh, another downside is, unfortunately on Debian, uh, synthetic events, events are not turned on on the kernel, right? So the other three distros have it turned on, and Debian does not, Debian uh, Bullseye uh, does not have it turned on. So hopefully they will change that for the future. I will file a bug for this for sure. Moving on, eBPF. Uh, eBPF is uh, not a tracer, but it's actually something that is using the built-in virtual machine runtime in the kernel. So the kernel has its own uh, virtual machine runtime. And with ePPF, I can actually write programs, load them into the kernel, and they will actually run inside the kernel in this virtual machine runtime. Uh, now, when it comes to tracing, you can actually attach these eBPF programs to trace points, which means when we go through a trace point, the CPU goes through a trace point, it can actually execute this little uh, virtual machine uh, program uh, from the runtime, uh, and ex I can get information that way, right? So this is how I can use EPF to perform tracing. Now, EPPF can be attached to trace points. It can be attached to U probes, so it's the user space probes. So I can, everything that I was able to do with F trace, I can also do with EBPF as far as the type of, and the amount of event, events that are supported. Uh, BP, EBPF has a several different methods that to use it. Uh, obviously, there's something called the BCC compiler. Uh, you can write really complex applications. Uh, this requires, obviously, a, a lot more know-how, but it also is much more powerful. Uh, however, there is a very nice tool called BPF Trace, and I highly recommend uh, taking a look at it. Uh, it has its own script-like language, and you can use this very simple script language uh, for BPF Trace, and it will compile the, B, uh, the eBPF uh, programs uh, for me and load them into the kernel. So BPF Trace makes it very, very easy. Oh, and I was debating, do I should I use BCC or use BPF Trace for this talk? Uh, and I found out that BPF Trace really has everything that I need. So it is immensely simpler, uh, and it works uh, fantastic, actually. So I used BPF Trace, actually, for the EPPF component of, of this talk. Uh, Yep, so the data can also be processed in kernel through the EPPF programs, right? So when I'm at an event, I can actually now decide, is this part of the, f the, the flow that I'm tracking? And I can store this information. And when the other event comes, it can check, is this the third event in, in, in the chain? And they can also store the information. So it can do all of this processing live, just like with ftrace, I was able to do it live. So as soon as the test is done, the data is already there, right? And EPPF has support for histograms. So for ftrace, I actually had to write a little Python program to generate that. Uh, with EPPF, you get that for free. So here's an example of what the BPF trace code looks like. This is so scripting code that I can give to BPF trace uh, to do the things I want. And just now, with the same as with uh, 
f trace, you can see there's actually four components here for the four different events. Where you know at the beginning, all I'm doing is drawing a timestamp, and then I'm interested in dealing with the, the pointer uh, of the buffer and the timestamp and the sender PID, etc. So the, as each event progresses in this flow, I'm storing more and more data, and on the final event, that's where I can actually look at the worst case and all these things uh, to determine the situation. Right. So you always see in all four of, in all of four of these tracing solutions, you'll see the four Four components there, where we're building these events. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. They're not called synthetic events here. Uh, they're actually just uh, hash tables. Here, but okay. So here is then the result. So as soon as the BPF, uh, the Hackbench mit EPF BPF trace is running. Uh, as soon as it's done, I can immediately see this information. It's spit out. The EPPF program actually generates that and spits this out uh, for me. And here I can see then, uh, you know, cause just like I generated before with uh, my Python program in Ftrace, here I can just see that with eBPF. Uh, it tells me immediately 5.6 uh, milliseconds was my uh, worst, uh, was my worst uh, event. It says nanoseconds, I see. <laughs> it's not actually nanoseconds, it's microseconds. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so 5.6 uh, milliseconds was the worst case uh, for the BPF. And it tells me that the worst the worst uh, situation was from PIDs 17557 to 17520. Right? So it's giving me that information. Now with EPPF, I also generated all of the schedule switching information. So I can also take a look at that and it will show me uh, all of the different schedule and switches and things like this so that I can identify uh, what was the scheduling in between the worst situation uh, as of the beginning and the end of the worst L uh, IPC communication, right? So I, it's not graphical, it's all there, and it's not sorted. So with BPF trace, it's not possible to sort uh, the, the hash table entries, uh, but uh, so, you know, it's very simple to just say, hey, I want to just sort based on the, on the second column here. So it's, it's not a big issue. Uh, and if I was using BCC, I could actually sort on, on the hash table entries. But uh, with BPF trace, that's not possible. Uh, so I had to do a little bit of work just to get in this form, but that's not much, right? So uh, it was pretty easily. And I can also see, now it's not graphic, but I can still see everything that's happening there, right? So, you know, this is, makes it a little bit more complicated because now I have to manage, okay, here's some wake-ups happening and switch, you know, which wake-ups happening to which switch. I can't see this here. On Kernel Shark, it was graphically displayed there, right? So you can, you can really easily see when these different things are happening. So a summary, uh, eBPF was the fastest. I only had a 31% uh, increase in runtime. It was the fa it was faster than Ftrace. Uh, it has the in-kernel processing, so as soon as it's over, I have the results immediately. Uh, the histogram is automatically generated for me, and all of the four uh, base distributions that I tested have support for eBPF. Bad downside for eBPF. Uh, obviously, uh, you're going to need the libbcc for the compiler, the libc, uh, uh, libclang, uh, LLVM. These are relatively large libraries that you will need on your system. Uh, for a desktop or a server, that's not a problem. For an embedded device, it might be too heavy uh, for, uh, depends on what you need. As I also mentioned, viewing the traces, it's not like, you know, I'm creating this format myself. I'm spitting things out in, in my own form with my own events. It's There is no viewer that's available where I can really easily uh, look at this information, right? So I, I do have to, you know, do some manual processing and sorting and, and kind of uh, grepping the information that I need there. Uh, and also for and again for Debian, uh, you use you, you probe offsets are not supported, right? So I couldn't actually do this test. It wouldn't actually wouldn't actually run wouldn't, on Debian uh, because Debian doesn't support you probe offsets, which I need. So I was not able to do that. Uh, but uh, there was an open bug on Debian, and I will reopen it. Okay, moving on to System Tap. A System Tap. Uh, feels a lot like EPPF, but the way it works is conceptually totally different. So with system tap, actually you will also write a script similar with BPF trace, you'll write a script, but this script will actually be converted into C code and compiled as a kernel module and loaded into the kernel that way. So you're actually running as a native kernel module and not in a virtual runtime as it is with EBPF.
Uh, system tap also supports all of the trace events, right? So I can write a script, it's compiled in a kernel module, and that's going to attach some code to the various trace uh, events. It also supports uprobes, however, only based on code line number. So I can't actually, for example, choose an actual offset uh, in the in the text segment. So I can actually choose a choose an offset uh, in the executable where I want my UPro to be inserted. I have to actually ch choose a line of code and that'll usually translate to that which you want. But that's not always the case, right? Because a line of code could do many things. Right. So uh, you and you want to you know, specify and if you're using optimization, it's even more difficult to translate that to what you actually want. Right. So the, use, being able to use the offsets is actually quite important. Good. But for this investigation, that was good enough. Uh, it was enough to I, there was actually a line I could specify and says, yeah, this is where the before we call read and this is after we uh, before we call write and this is after we've called read. Right. So it was good enough. Uh, this tool what you use with system tab is called STAP. And like I mentioned, uh, there's a scripting language that's available and S, you just give STAP your script and it will compile the kernel module for you and, and load it. Uh, as system tap also supports in kernel data processing, so live processing. So just like with eBPF and uh, with ftrace, you are able to actually do the live flow control processing, uh, so that in the moment that it's done, you can take a look, or you don't have to wait for it to be done. At any moment, you can take a look and say, what's the worst case latency? Yeah, and I can say from this. PID to this PID is the worst latency I've seen so far, right? But uh, it's doing this live, right, the whole time. So you can look at it anytime you want. And System Tab also supports outputting histograms similar to uh, eBPF or BPF trace, actually. Uh, and it supports iterating hash tables, which is something that, uh, that uh, BPF trace, unfortunately, does not support yet. But, you know, if, that's, if you really need that, maybe take the time to learn BCC. Here's just what the script looks like in System Tap. This is extremely similar to BPF Trace. Both of them are basically uh, modeled out um, DTrace. Uh, so it's, you can almost one to one, it's just syntax changes, but it's almost exactly the same if you were to compare setting up these four different uh, you know, modules that, I, that I'm building is, is like the four different BPF programs that we had before, right? So it's almost identically the same there. So if you if you know eBPF system tap uh, I'm sorry if you know BPF trace system tap is really easy to switch to and if you know system tap moving to BPF trace is also quite easy. Here's what the histogram uh, on ND, um, at the end looked like for system tap. Uh, it also spits out for me the the worst uh, latency that I saw and the IPC uh, the two PIDs that were involved in that worst latency. It also spits for me uh, out the list of scheduling events, but since I'm a, I able with System Tab, I'm able to uh, iterate through this. Then it means I was able to automatically sort it so that it's automatically spitting out a sorted time sorted list, and I could do things like adding little, little uh, so metadata there. So like it, it would spit out and say these are the lines that are dealing with the sender. Here's lines dealing with the worst case receiver, right? So I could actually just uh, iterate through this hash rate and spit this information out. And this is also done live, right? So at any time, uh, you know, if this is a uh, hack bench doesn't end, it just keeps going, going, going. Uh, anytime I could just uh, spit this information out and it's annotated and everything like this, right? So it's actually quite nice. This live processing is, is, is quite helpful. Again, we have no graphical tool, right? So, you know, I will have to later figure out what all this stuff in the middle actually means or where, who belongs to what, uh, but uh, the information is there. Right? System tap, the advantages, obviously you have the in-kernel processing, which is, is really nice to have, right? Because many times you can't just have your system run and stop and now we're done, right? Like it's just running and you just want to go in there and then now we start grabbing the information uh, and, and live viewing that information. That's, that's in-kernel processing is really nice for that. You have the histograms that are, can be easily generated uh, and the uh, sorted hash table viewing, which is really automatic, right? So it comes, things just come out automatically from the kernel in the format you want to have them. 
SystemTap has things called tap sets. These are basically um, script functions that have already been written for me. So there's a lot of really nice uh, functions I can use to make my scripting really easier. You know, if I just want to you know, grab a stack trace or I want to uh, find uh, you know, what is my schedule state or something like this. You know, there's a whole bunch of tap sets that are available and I just basically call a function and I get this maybe complex information. You know, there's some things that are like network specific and things like this. So that can, makes it really nice uh, for writing more complex scripts. Available on Fedora, Debian, and Arch. Uh, unfortunately, on OpenSUSE, uh, it was... I really tried to get it to work, but uh, OpenSUSE was just complaining about uh, it was Tumbleweed that I was using. So this is the you know latest greatest from OpenSUSE, but uh, it just I could not get it to compile. Right, so it was, it was complaining about missing headers. Uh, I looked at it with strace, and it was finding the headers. So I'm not sure why uh, the the STAP compiler was complaining that it couldn't find them. But sorry, couldn't get it working on Open OpenSUSE, so it's not OpenSUSE is not in that list. Here, the runtime increased 84%, which I actually put in the cons section, because this is almost double what the other tracing methods had, right? So this is definitive slower. Maybe, I don't know if it's because uh, the type of scripts I was writing are particularly inefficient or what, or what the deal is there, uh, but it, system tap is uh, definitely uh, affecting runtime more than ftrace and ebpf were. This, in fact, this is the slowest of them, of the four. Uh, the uprobe support is limited to line numbers. This might be okay for you, but you know a lot of people like to uh, optimize applications and things like this. Uh, line number might not mean anything, right? <laughs> so that might not be enough. Uh, it has a huge set of dependencies because we have to compile kernel modules, right? So, uh, and it is possible to have the, to build these like offline and then just load them, but it, it gets quite complex. Uh, these are just uh, dependencies to be aware of. And because we're buying uh, compiling kernel modules, they might not actually build if you're using some sort of exotic uh, third-party uh, hardware uh, uh, kernel. Uh, you might maybe for some reason you, you can't actually even build the kernel modules, right? So it's uh, it's complex because it relies on so kernel model module code templates to build for the kernel, right? That wasn't the problem with OpenSUSE, but uh, uh, that can be a, in general a problem. So the last one, LTTNG. Uh, LTTNG is, is different than the other three because it is a complete tracing infrastructure. So it has kernel modules, it has user space libraries, it has user space tools, has all kinds of things. And basically, uh, LTTNG is really meant to be a complete solution that you adopt for all of your tracing needs, for user space, for kernel, for uh, kernel user space, anything. Uh, so it's, it's more than just... Uh, like a tracing method, it's it's a infrastructure really. Uh, in particular, the libraries it has very powerful libraries that make it really easy to write programs to, for example, parse data and, and do things like this. LTDNG supports all the kernel of trace events, uh, and it supports uprobes, but the uprobe support is really only limited to symbols. Right, so I can only specify a function. I can't spe specify a line of code or an offset inside of the program. Uh, and unfortunately, that wasn't good enough for this investigation because I needed that U probe. It's in the middle of a, of a sender and receiver functions. I can't. It's not enough to just set the sender function, right? So unfortunately for LTT and G, I needed to use USDT, which means I must modify Hackbench and add those trace points manually. Uh, the tool that's available for LTTNG is called LTTNG. That's basically the tool to start everything, start the session, stop the sessions, uh, and, and look at things. Uh, and the traces are recorded, and they are then post-processed. So LTTNG does not offer live uh, data processing like the other ones did, right? So you have to be aware that you're going to record a trace, and then you're going to have to post-process that trace at a later point using the various tools and libraries. And it also includes a graphical viewer, which call, is called Trace Compass, uh, which is, we will take a look in a minute. is a quite powerful graphical viewer. So here's just a qu quick to show you uh, the patch. I actually had to modify Hackbench and just add these two trace points. Now there's a couple more code I have to. There's an include and there's another uh, template file that's generated. But this is the actual 
code that had to be modified. I, I just needed to insert the before write and the after read tr uh, USDT trace points so that LTT and G uh, could react to these events, right? And before using uprobe offsets or even line numbers, I could just specify this line here, for example, uh, or I could specify this line here, and it would do do the same thing, right? Without modifying the code. So at, with LTT and G, you, you are in a, a different mode. You have to think in in terms of post processing, right? You're 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 not doing things live, uh, and so there's actually really great libraries uh, in Python available. So they're called Babel Trace Two. It's a great library, and it's a tool, by the way, where you can also look at all these traces. Uh, and here, basically, you'll just uh, have uh, you'll just iterate through all of the collected events, and you can very easily with Python then decide what to do. So basically, everything that I was doing live with eBPF or System Tap or uh, Ftrace, uh, I'm doing it post processing here. But you still see the four events. So here's you know if I have this kind of event, this is my processing, this kind of event. So I'm doing the same thing, slowly collecting more and more data to get to this end event. The code is almost identical, but the difference is, and it's a big difference, one is post-processing and one is live processing, right? So, uh, but it, I just wanted to show that you can see there the analogies, it's, it's, it's quite it's similar, the logic, uh, the way that it's handled. And this doesn't automatically generate a, a here I use my Python code again to spit out this, but I had a nice hash table that I could iterate with all this information, but uh, I used Python to generate uh, a hash table again so that we could see the worst case if it fits inside the curve. Uh, and then I also gave out with my Python post processing, gave, gave, can out get this information as well, right? So we get all the same information, but it's it's being post processed, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it just depends. But uh, it, it is really nice to have a, a system that's just do live processing, and you just say, show me the current state, and it just spits it out in the right format, right? You don't have to, like, uh, you know, extract log files or anything like this, uh, go offline and things like, you know. Here's the graphical program where I'm now going to investigate the worst case scenario, right? So we have uh, this is called Trace Compass, and you can really, it has a lot of stuff here. I really had a hard time just figuring out what I want to put on here. Uh, but here you can see all the different uh, events. This is the receiver that's totally scheduled way at the end here to receive this. Uh, here I'm also showing this is the sender and you see the sender was done at this point and the receiver was getting scheduled at this point so in the middle of nothing. Uh, you can also see the CPU was pretty much uh, all four of the CPUs were pretty much full the whole time so there's no idle sitting in there. But anyway, uh, there's a lot of available tools for LTD and G. You see here there's a lot of different um, so some wizards or intelligent things that can go through and match things and help a lot. Uh, it's really quite powerful, powerful tool. I'm not going to go into it here. It's uh, talk for itself, uh, but it's uh, quite powerful for uh, doing the post analyzing uh, of what happened. Right. So for LTT and G, the runtime increased 49%, which is, I believe, the third best, right? And uh, we have the graphical viewing with uh, Trace Compass, right? So, and th and this is, by the way, I have it under Pro because it's still way under uh, almost it's still almost half of, uh, of of what we had with uh, System Tap. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, libraries for post processing. Uh, Debian, Fedora, and OpenSUSE have been support for it. Uh, unfortunately, under Arch. Uh, the tools package, LTTTNG tools package, is just plain broken, right? So uh, it's also in the, if you go to the package logs, you can see it has been uh, confirmed that it's broken. So unfortunately, uh, right now, that's not going to work for Arch. Uh, other things that are a problem, uh, maybe a s small problem, uh, the limited uprobe support, right? So we can only use symbols. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's probably not going to be enough for you. Uh, so you may have to modify your application. Maybe that's not a problem for you, but it's nice to not have to modify applications. It's nice to take something done, and now let's just investigate why it's acting strange, right? That's a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, this also has to build its own LTG and G kernel modules. That, that means you need the compiler and the kernel headers in order to do that. So you might also have problem building kernel modules, the same problem that SystemTap uh, could have. 
And what I also found is that the kernel modules were not pre-packaged for Fedora and OpenSUSE. So for Fedora and OpenSUSE, uh, LTTG does work, but you have to download the, the modules and compile them yourself. Not a big deal, but still, uh, you know, if we look at Debian, for example, it's really out of the box. LTTG just works, right? There's, there's nothing you have to download or manually uh, compile or build. It just works, right? So that's it's really nice. So now this is a summary uh, based on usability, runtime effects, presentation results, and the availability. I had a really hard time putting these ra these rankings together uh, because a lot of things it's really a close call and it's really hard to decide. But at the end of the day, I do feel like this is the appropriate uh, ranking for the different tools. Uh, this was the easiest one because it's just a, a number compare, right? But all the other ones, it was really difficult. I have to say, uh, I'm, I usually don't use eBPF, but working with BPF Trace is really a pleasant experience. So that's just, if you have not used BPF Trace, I uh, really recommend trying that out. Also, please keep in mind, this is based on the my experiences with this investigation. So if you have a total different sub uh, set of problems uh, for tracing, maybe it would be different. And finally, if you were assigned points to all of those individual ratings, and then you could assign a top three, top four uh, rate ratings, is, it was really that eBPF came out on top, uh, being the fastest, uh, easy to use, and things like this. Uh, its biggest drawback is, you know, viewing the data, really. You know, what's really e missing in eBPF is if you had some sort of official format where you could s send things into uh, so that, you know, you could use, uh, for example, a trace compass or something like this to view the eBPF uh, traces. That would be a huge uh, uh, feature for eBPF because that's really where it's uh, lacking. Um, F-Trace, LTTNG, and unfortunately System Tap, although is also very nice to use, uh, uh, you know, it's not bad, but it just, there's so, um, it's like third and fourth place on everything. And so at the end, it's, it just uh, couldn't make, make it up there. Again, based on this investigation, uh, this does not mean that System Tap isn't generally a bad tracing solution. I thank you for my for your attention, uh, and I hope you learned a little bit about what's out there. And I really encourage you to try them all because uh, it's not that hard, and it's a good experience. And for example, then you start to learn the advantages that the difference have to offer. And so, if you are presented with a certain problem, you might say, "Hey, I know that System Tap has a whole bunch of tap sets that are great for this uh, domain. Uh, we can use that," or you know whatever, you know, we say, hey, we need U probes with offsets, then you can Im immediately say, okay, LTT and G is not going to work for me and system tap as well, right? So uh, just being aware of these things can really help you to decide how to trace your problems. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, have fun at Embedded Linux Conference 2021.